but it was unique in the sense that it was manager and assistant manager. Mm. And directors had thought for 20, 30, 40 years that it was a one-man job. We discovered early doors that it was a two-man job. And, of course, now it's been uh, copied for the last 20 or 30 years. Yes, and the chemistry was good. It was absolutely brilliant. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. He was that good at his job in those days, Taylor. He used to see things 24 hours before I did. Really? Uh, regarding players. And uh, his, his renowned ability for signing players, i.e. the Archie Gamels and all that type of thing, uh, is second to none. Mm. The, his message to me, because he never used to attend matches, I'm not sure if he used to attend the matches he was going to see the players, but anyway, that's by and by. But he went to see Archie Gamble, who was playing for Preston, just to give you an off-handed uh, example, and he phoned in at 5.30, and he says, get in your car and come and sign Archie Gamble. Is that good? Now, nobody can be more positive than that, and then I had to go and do all the work, obviously, of trying to get and buy and all that type of thing. But he'd done the initial work. And just to throw names away, when I was talking to Sinatra, he said, the written word is the first one. The music comes later. And in football, the one who picks the player comes first. All the bullshit comes later. Well, one man who was picked out early by Derby County was Dave Mackay, signed from Spurs, magnificent leader, inspirational player, and the cornerstone of Derby's climb to glittering success. Dave, Dave was the best. The cornerstone is an is a underestimation of David Mackay's influence at Derby County. He was the Derby County, and he was the championship second division and championship first division eventually. European Cup days and all sorts. Dave was a competitor mm. at every level and lost his temper when he lost mm. and lost his temper with his colleagues. Uh, but they were all impressionable young men, as I was, and we were all standing back in awe of David. And not only was he playing and winning matches and championships for us, he didn't know, but he was doing my job as well. But I soon twigged he was doing my job, so I was very grateful. And he eventually he played sweeper. But he was used to covering every blade of the grass on a football pitch, as you well know. And that was his image. And he couldn't visualise you sitting at the back and using the vast experience and the enormous talent that he had. But he didn't know he had it till he played there. It's like most of us, you know. Come, it's brought out on certain occasions. And David Mackay was... He was certainly the best player in the Football League at that time. And he was better than Bobby Moore, who was playing for England, who I tried to sign afterwards, uh, when David had finished, or during the same time or whatever, he was better than Bobby Moore, and Bobby finished up with 105 caps, and wrote a bad book. He shouldn't have told them I tapped him up. You didn't? I did. It was at the Churchill Hotel in London, but he shouldn't have told anybody. The chairman at Derby was Sam Longson. Now, Sam enjoyed a good cigar, but also a splendid relationship during the first Clough Taylor years. Indeed, the managerial pair were happy to sign a new contract in a blaze of publicity. But when Brian looks back, what was his major achievement at the baseball ground? The best thing I did was I won the second division uh, at Derby. And I, won the, I got promotion at Nottingham Forest out the second division. Mm. They were as vivid and are uh, still to this day than the European jobs and the first division championships and all sorts. It just depends what makes you tick and what turns you on and all that type of thing. But that was the first sign of success at two clubs, at Derby and Nottingham Forest, getting out the second division. And they gave me more pleasure than everything else. But Derby also won the league championship, and glorious nights in the European Cup were to follow. Hinton. And it's Hinton going to take the corner. Not a short one this time. But again aimed towards McFarland. Hector. Yes! McFarland. Daniel. Loose. McGovern. 
skillful players, canny management. Indeed, as before that Benfica game, Clough had ordered that the pitch should be very heavily watered. Why? I didn't want the Portuguese coming, fancy dans as they were, mm. but talented players. Mm. I didn't want them coming portraying too much of the talent. Mm. So we bogged them down and absolutely, to use, uh, walked all over them. Mm. Or used the water mm. and pissed all over them. Mm. Juventus, you didn't walk all over them though. They beat the 3-1 there and they bought the German referee, he was from West Germany actually, and they bought him. And then they, we, we got a non non at our place and got knocked out the semi-final of the European Cup. We genuinely really thought we could win it. Mm. I mean, you and genuinely it, felt, I mean, you've said that at the time and you're saying it again now. That oh, it was, it the, was the Times newspaper used to run a, um, a column or whatever it was called, called Insight in those days. I don't know whether it still mm. does now since... Uh, does it, do they still do it now, mm. Insight? Mm. Well, Murdoch will have absolutely murdered the column. Mm. See, he owns the bloody times, doesn't mm. he? What a tragedy that people like him can own our times. Mm. Um, and they had a, a thing called Insight. And they did a very, very profound, factual thing into the buying of the referees. And the one who blew it was the guy who was refereeing the match at Derby. And he was a Portuguese referee. And they offered him 5,000 quid. And he blew the whole thing. And FIFA, all these powerful bodies who are now stopping us going into Europe and all that, didn't do that much. Mm. And it was proved absolutely conclusively that the West German referee was bought. Mm. Well, they may have been out of Europe, but Derby was still a treat to watch in the first division, here against Manchester United and then Sheffield United. Is going to take it himself. Or it might be Hinton. So Dave Mackay scored a goal at West Bromwich Albion in this sort of situation last season. And my God, he hit the post! McFarlane! McFarlane to score! The game's still on, it's Durban for McGovern! And it tickled! A back heel from Hinton! I think Keith Walker could have given the, the other decision. Oh, there's Durban! Oh, what a perfect little goal! Alan Durban! Hennessy. A little touch off. Hector in. And he scores. Kevin Hector. McFarland up. McGovern now for Derby. That's a good one. What a good one. John McGovern. We took off, as I said earlier, and uh, obviously everybody came in on the act, so to speak. I used to go out in my waistcoat, and in those days I was like a ninepenny rabbit and people hadn't or weren't used to football managers talking and that type of thing and I got involved with you a lot. So the prominence of Derby, they'd already won the league championship as we know and now it seemed the sky was the limit for Cluffy. I think I, I, think I would like the supreme job of, uh, of dictating football and that's a supreme job and I mean dictating football I mean right down to the school level, right down to the coaching level and saying this is how I believe it should be done. I don't think we have too many experts running our game. I think the people within the game run it and I think this is wrong. I think if, uh, if you've got a financial wizard outside, he should be brought in to run the financial affairs of the Football League. Or at least his advice should be sought. And I would pay an awful lot of money to people whose job it is to look after finance to do just that. The FA have got a, f a file on Derby County, I'm certain, of the fines the players have had to take from me for doing things that shouldn't have been done. I wish everybody was fined for doing naughty things in football. Opinions, opinions, and another famous one was that the Polish goalkeeper Tomaszewski, now to face England in a vital World Cup qualifier, was a clown. Well, I called him the clown at Wembley when we were doing the live Poland v England match and we got knocked out of the World Cup qualifying matches and I stuck by it, obviously, and had to stick by it when I met him uh, two or three, four years later. Because whether he was a clown or whether he wasn't, he was big. Peters over the ball. Curry just behind him, Peters takes it, Chivers goes in. A little bit too long for him. And Tomaszewski immediately in trouble rolling the ball to Clark's feet. Shot on for England Hughes. Not now. McFarlane. Clark's all right. And he squeezed one in as the Poles were 
looking for the offside decision, which wasn't there. Shot on McCurry. Tomachev is still a mile up his line. Curry against Kasperjak. Done him once. Not a bad cross ball. Tomachevsky lost that one completely. He was certain it was going behind. Tied by Shonovsky. Tomachevsky's not there. Tomachevsky, an incredible save. Kicked it away from Clark. Far post. But he knocked us out of the World Cup, and how he kept shots out of his goal that particular night, and how we didn't win 6 or 7 1, I will never ever know to this day. Mm. I do know because that's football. Mm. And I commiserated with, I took the trouble to leave the gantry where I was walking, uh, working with you, and I walked across the Wembley pitch and went into the dressing room. And it, was, it was only the second or third time, and said to Alf, who I think regarded me as not one of his best friends in those days, Alf Ramsey, and said, for what it's worth, I said, you must be the unluckiest guy in football at this present time. I said, because you could have done that lot seven. And he said, thanks very much, and out I walked. Well, he took plenty of criticism for that Tomaszewski remark, but that didn't stop him, even if other people in the game now began to call him arrogant. Arrogant, perhaps, is a fair word, uh, and conceited, certainly. I, I'm, I'm conceited uh, in respect of having got a side like Derby from where we were certainly. and worked bloody hard for four years and got them to where we are now. Now, I know I've not won a championship or anything like that, but, you know, if Malcolm Allison and Don Revy are not proud, conceited, call it what you like about their achievements, I think there's something the matter with them. Mm. I think conceit and arrogance is part of a man's makeup. Perhaps I've got too much. Outspoken, I don't know. I'm still well. I think you gave, you, yourself, you gave yourself the name of the big head, didn't you? I mean, you. you well, only quite, now I give yeah, it. Yeah, only was, now, but it yeah. came obviously. But I, I think... was good fodder for you lot down there, and a good fodder for the London scene. And Barbara, as she says, she said, "I think you talked yourself out the England manager's job," and I think she could be right. Did you also possibly talk yourself in the end out of the Derby County job? Because I think Sam Longson, the chairman at this time, was getting a little worried about your exposure on TV. There was even talk then that he maybe want to vet the things you were saying and writing. Sam switched. Sam wanted me to project uh, Derby County Football Club in the early days. And he wanted to meet uh, you and he wanted to meet Bobby Moore and he wanted to something, something. And he wanted to do all the things that every chairman wants to do. But once having done them, he then said, well, I think we better get respectable now, uh, after about five or six years. And where he'd been showing me there on the motorway to go on television, and actually, uh, at a board meeting, it was minuted where he actively encouraged me to take jobs on television. It switched over a period of three or four years. Mm. And he felt then I was devoting too much time and all that type of thing. But that's the way it goes. He... he he brought a rule out when I first wor uh, worked there, because he was the first uh, guy who took me to Derby County. And he felt that directors, having got to 65, should be uh, finished with the club and resign from the board and all that type of thing. And he got a minute through to that effect. But of course, when the old bastard got to 65 himself, he changed it. Now, when the rules don't suit him, and when they're in power, they change the rules. Now, they cheat more than you and I. You don't cheat. I've bent a few in my time. But they change the rules when it doesn't suit them. I think, uh, in spite of it all, uh, except maybe right at the very... You still had a very good relationship with him. It was almost, oh, it was he incredible. used to say, like a father-son relationship, wasn't well, it? Well, it was absolutely incredible. He'd got three daughters, and they were Quakers. He'd brought them up in the Quaker school at Darlington with three daughters. And I think, deep down somewhere along the line, he did want a son. I came into his life, and I had three two sons and a daughter and uh, what appeared to be a, a nice family and we went for four, five, six years like a house on fire. Mm. Absolutely like a house. It couldn't have been kind if it had been my own dad. Mm. Well, why did it finish then? Well, I, I said he, went, he, he wanted then to calm down and he, he then wanted to... He actually tried to get on the league management committee. <laughs> <laughs> for his bloody sins, he tried to get among that lot. 
Um, so he wanted to go into that area of, uh, of, of yeah. league and uh, football management or whatever you call it. And I think he wanted to uh, sit near Len Shipman, and, uh, who was the league president in those days, dear old Len, who was um, a good friend of mine, a good friend. And I think he looked at the Football Association and he'd had a taste of the Royal Box. Of course, that throws the bloody lot of them, you know. You know mm. when they get a taste of that, mm. they love it, you know. Mm. Mm. And they sit there and they think, well, now, you know, I'd, I could do with this for the next five years. But they don't realise, they forget what it costs to get there. Mm. Hard work and a bit of sweat and a few swear words mm. and whatever. So what you're saying is that the breakup at Derby, in fact, was all over the TV uh, appearances. And, and no, not not all over the no. TV appearances, but uh, uh, little other things and all that type of thing. And Taylor was actually we were at Old Trafford the last match before I resigned, and we beat uh, Manchester United one nil at Old Trafford, and I went second or third in the first division. Now that wasn't a position where you resign from, and I'd just signed about six weeks previous a four-year contract, and he. Mr. Longson had given me 21,000 quid a year, which, by your standards, not a lot of cash, but by my standards in those days, a fortune. And I got myself a 90,000 pound contract, and I was still full of myself, and I thought, well, I can see the four years out, I'll get my house paid for, and all that type of thing, and the, the future looked rosy. But things did sour, and a guy came on the board who wanted Taylor to account for what he was doing. And it blew up at Old Trafford, actually. Really? And um, it was a bloke called Jack Kirkland, and he gave Taylor, uh, you, could, you could, in football, we take anything, as you well know. We take the lot, like mm. coppers do. Mm. They have to. It's the mm. job to take mm. all that. Mm. And in turn, sometimes you have to mm. take the, the rough end. And uh, across the boardroom, um, or the lounge, or whatever it is at Old Trafford, the director did that to Taylor with his bloody finger. Now, I'm telling you, nobody had done that to us since I was at school. And uh, it's like calling somebody sir, you know. They, they get mm. sir if, mm. if they deserve sir, but sir, I'll give him sir. And he's giving it that, wiggling his finger, and I want to see you on Monday morning. And, of course, Taylor came down into the dressing room and absolutely was uh, inconsolable. And he said, I've gone through, uh, not, we're not going through all that. So... That was the very last thing that sparked it off. So I went to a hastily convened board meeting that particular week, and I says, you can stick your contract right up your jack, see? Uh, I'm off, and, uh, and it went from there. But that simply started a series of protests through the streets of Derby. The fans wanted the board out, and Clough and Taylor to remain. And, from all accounts, the players felt much the same way. They went on strike, poor lads. They went on yeah. strike and... Um, I mean, that was never going to succeed, was it? No, no, it couldn't. We, we, we slipped up, actually. We got a plane from East Midlands and we should have gone. Then we'd have thrown a cat among the pigeons and we uh, a bit of sense prevailed and we didn't get out on the plane and... Uh, really? You'd, you'd actually sort of got a... Oh, yes, we'd got all organised. <laughs> no, so what, to, to leave Derby? Well, to no, we just, just to miss the Saturday's match. Really? <laughs> yes. And uh, <coughs> we had bags of meetings and bags of friends, but of course sense hmm. comes to the surface in more situations. Um, as Barbara often says, it's only men who cause problems. You hmm. know, if women ruled the world, there'd be no wars. Hmm. We'd live in a better world, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, of course, the women came and said, hey, just a minute. We've got two kids, one kid, mortgage up to here. Could it get it all sorted out? Mm. And uh, well, that's what happened. You eventually got it sorted out by going to Brighton. I took there. money to go to Brighton. I took money. And that was the wrong reason for going to Brighton. I should have gone to Brighton because I was out of work, and it was the job. But the money was an incentive. And that possibly coloured me. But I think if I'd, I only stayed there nine months, and Mike Bamber, who I worked for... The chairman of Brighton. Yes, was the best chairman I ever worked for. And I've worked for some crackers. He was the best chairman ever. What he put up with while I was at Brighton is nobody's business. Like what? Like losing 8-2 at home. To Bristol Rovers. Ah. Parsons playing a long ball forward. Warboys is onside. Is this going to be his hat-trick? It is! 
it's number seven for Bristol Rovers. Towner. No, stopped again by Taylor. Or rather by Green. And here's Warboys onside. The linesman's kept his flag down. And that's his fourth goal. And Bristol Rovers eighth. Well, on the bench that day with their father were Brian's two sons, Simon and Nigel. And indeed, Nigel was on my lap in a TV studio the following day. What did you think of Brighton yesterday? All right. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. That's right. Busy. You were there, mm. doing it mm. all, big, giving it big licks, mm. bloody loving it. You've shown it 43,000 times. Um, and Mike put up with me. But in spite of the Brighton chairman's patience, Clough was about to start the most turbulent chapter of his entire management career. 